So Taylor seismology of extensional environments, this is a, a lot to cover, but topics include geometry of normal faults, observing historic ruptures, the traces and the displacement distributions, mountain front activity, so the geomorphology of different mountain fronts, the fault scarf geomorphology, which is also our exercise for this afternoon. And then the colluvial wedge model for paleo seismology is a kind of a famous one for extensional systems. And then I'll give some other examples. So first is let's just go look at a, a fault where I have some LIDAR in, uh, in a normal fault in Wyoming. So here we are, ITB, got seatbelts, we're in space. North Pacific, okay, going to Western North America. And now I'll turn on the active fault map. So this is a map from U.S. Geological Survey. The different colors are different rates of, mo of motion. So blue are slow and red are fast. And just shows all the active faults in the, especially this region, the basin range, mostly extensional. So where we're going is, is, um, this, normal fault system that bounds this mountain range. This is called the Grand Tetons or the Teton Mountain Range. And you see these normal fault boundaries here next to the basin. So it's a, a young active normal fault. So we'll fly in and now I'll turn the faults off because they're slow the so Google Earth down and turn on the the LIDAR data. So we have a strip along the fault zone. And this is the hill shade, so let's look at it from the side. So the idea with this video is just to show a little bit of the geomorphology of the fault zone. You see the main mountain front there with the, let me see if I can stop for just a moment. So you see these mountains, this is probably at least a thousand meters of relief going up to the, the top. And so this is uh, the cumulative effect of the normal faulting is to, to build the relief. But then you see these sharp lines along. Here are the me most recent ruptures. And the other geomorphology to appreciate is you see these lines here. These are moraines. And so in the last glacial time, there was a big glacier that was in this valley and it came out and it pushed the ice into this lake. So these are the debris that was on the side of the glacier. So let's just go and have a tour along the fault zone. But sometimes there, like you see this area, some distributed deformation along the fault zone. So it's not just a simple, just single trace, normal fault, but there's kind of almost a grove in here with uh, the main fault on one side and the secondary anesthetic structure on this side. So some of this complexity will capture things like the glaciers. They'll get stuck in these places and then uh, modify and interact with the faulting. So just zooming in. So this will, I'll show you the digital surface model in just a moment. So there's the DSM, there's the trees. So we're looking mostly at the DTM. And so you see this pretty big scarf right in there. And then this place that's kind of interesting, this little perched uh, feature. And then you see the faults. So you don't see really much in the Google Earth imagery, but in the hillshade, it's quite clear. Faults cutting across here. And then this place is kind of interesting, I think, that fracturing zone. So again, it's hard to see much with the Google Earth imagery. The trees are obscuring everything. So there's some more faulty. Yes. So just, uh, this is just a point about the the traces, these are mostly, uh, it's all of this line is not, but these others are historic earthquakes, normal faulting earthquakes. And so one thing you can see is that they typically are discontinuous. So you see Dixie Valley steps, steps 
actually this is the Pleasant Valley earthquake, but it it has, you know, one, two, three, four sections that broke and some of them are quite far apart, you know, almost six, seven kilometers. So the and then here you see this one actually in this transfer zone, this earthquake Dixie Valley, you see this is dipping this way. And then you go over here, and this is dipping this way. So it's a step over that flips the dip direction. So it's, uh, again, showing the complexity of the, the, the ruptures. Same with, with this Hebgen Lake earthquake. Um, and then this just shows a piece. This is a, a little bit longer piece of fault, the, the kind of most famous normal fault in Western North America, the Wasatch Fault Zone. And it is segmented. I talked about this at the, towards the beginning. You see these breaks here. These arrows show the ideas of, of where we think the boundaries in the future earthquakes will occur and maybe where the boundaries in the prior earthquakes have been. But there's no historic earthquakes on the Wasatch Fault. But the idea is that there would be an earthquake that probably would just be on the southern section and this bend is maybe too big to go across. And then another piece, another piece, another one, another one. So this is uh, important, and it's another reason why when we think of potential earthquake magnitudes for normal fault, they don't tend to be as large as for strikes, that especially or reverse, because of the segmented nature. We think they'll stop too early, more likely to stop early. So that's why... The, the sizes of these, like this is a 7.5, it's the biggest one here. The rest of them are 7.0, 6.9, 7.3. It's hard to get 8.0 normal faulting event because it's too long and the ruptures just get stuck. They can't, they can't go all that far. So these are just some of the geometric parameters of these earthquakes. So you see the size is okay. So head being like was 7.6, but you see the maximum displacements are three to six meters. The length of ruptures are pretty short, ex except for this Fairview Peak, but you see it's still smaller than Hebgen Lake, which was fairly short. So if we have, how can we get a big earthquake? You know, how can this be bigger than this one if it's shorter? What do you think? What's something that could be different that's not shown on this table? The width. Yeah, exactly. Very good. So this one might have ruptured deeper. It also obviously had more slip, but the, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, 1.5 times as much slip, but half as much length. And it's, remember the equation seismic moment equals shear modulus times the U bar times A. So the average slip and will, this will make this 1.5 times larger, but this would make it half as much moment. But if we increase the width, the down dip width, we could get to recover. And that's the idea. The observations that head can lake from the seismology implied deeper rupture. So these are some other older events that were not immediately studied after the earthquake, but there's a famous one in in uh, Italy, 6.9, that was very damaging, caused problems. So here's just some pictures. You see this one's the 1915 Pleasant Valley earthquake, and this really beautiful ribbon of the rupture right at the base of the mountain front. So very clear. And then here you see the scarf going along. So this is maybe the classic model, simple range front rupture. So I've already talked about Bora Peak a few times, so I just remind you about this. So here was Bora Peak, there's Hebgen Lake earthquake, and then there's this group of the other ones that I, I we saw in the earlier slide. So um, this parts of, of North America that have been activated by these normal faulting earthquakes are shown. So there was Bora Peak rupture and Bora Peak the mountain. And then, as I showed before, the, and we analyzed with our dislocation modeling, the 
direct effect at the fault of the offset and then also this displacements going away from the fault that were measured by the leveling. And then the final point here is the geologic manifestation of repeated faulting that that build the, built the sedimentary basin. And you see the sedimentary basin is one and a half kilometers deep. So it's this our fault's been active for a while. And the total offset, you see TEV connects to TEV, so the total offset is maybe six kilometers since TEV time with tertiary volcanic. Because this is a cross section, so they show it as a, in the cross section of the focal mechanism. So if you looked at it from the map view, it would be normal. But this is a, a vertical slice through the focal mechanism. Football. Good, very good question. I don't know. It could be a little bit of a location, relocation problem that the velocities are a little higher here than here on this side, so they they're pulled over because the velocity model was a uniform velocity, but actually there's a velocity contrast. The other thing that people explored was that perhaps the fault isn't planar; that it it is uh, listric. So it goes down through the the cloud. Usually the main shock sits in the middle of the aftershock cloud, all things being equal. Sometimes you'll see in map view the we go to remember Jessica's question. Here's the map of Bora Peak. Sometimes you'll see that there's more aftershocks on the ends or in these transfer zones because the the rocks are more cracked and there's a little bit more stress concentration near the discontinuity. So if you have really good aftershock relocation, you might see see more here than here. But for most studies, where the, especially these older events, the aftershocks are not extremely well located. So, you know, especially if it's a, what we say is a unilateral rupture. So if the the hypocenter is on one end of the rupture. If this is the future complete rupture, and if the rupture starts here and it goes this way, then in that sense, the main shock is on the edge of the aftershock cloud. So that, that can be one point. The other thing is that sometimes it's difficult to really identify the hypocenter location because you can have multiple moment release patches. And so it's kind of ambiguous where exactly the main shock was. Although you can say it's the initiation point. That's the definition of a hypocenter, but maybe it's a little hard to tell exactly. Uh, so yeah, or it's again, although I would say 2006, the location should be pretty good for the aftershock, but sometimes you have a bias that the, you know, if the network is, is, if you locate the main shock by a regional network, and then afterwards you go in and you have an aftershock deployment, deployment with more seismometers, you're actually locating the event maybe with different data sets, seismological data sets, unless you relocate the main shock with a better velocity model. So so sometimes there can be a mismatch. Dixie Valley, we've already talked about Dixie Valley. I just show where it is. This was 1954 earthquake. And this part of the, the lecture just shows a little bit about the Flip distributions or the offset distribution. So, in this case, the vertical displacement. So we, so this is, you know, vertical separation versus distance along the fault. And you see, you know, 50 centimeters on this this guy, and then this fairly simple section gets up to 2.5 meters of vertical offset, and then this this little box canyon seems to be some kind of a. a barrier or some kind of a transition zone where the, the slip is a little bit low there. And then we go back up in this IXL canyon and down. And and one thing they show is the the main faults in the back and this big embayment. But then there's some additional faulting on the uh, what he calls the scarps in the Piedmont, these these guys here. And so they're not very important, just, you know, maybe uh, 50 centimeters, and you see some are negative, so that means it's mostly 
east side down, but these negatives would be west side down. So there's some problems in here. So this was a well-studied uh, event, although Kasky, he studied it 35 years after the earthquake occurred, but because it was in the desert, it was pretty well preserved. So this one's just trying to show that it's uh, kind of a norm normalized, so it's the percent of maximum vertical separation or vertical offset versus percent of length. Just trying to show how, what's the overall pattern. So this Dixie Valley I, is uh, what I just showed, but from from before this study. So they had, didn't have so many points. And you see Pleasant Valley, Fairview Peak. So some of them are fairly symmetric, like this one, Pleasant Valley, seems to have the peak in the middle. Every peak may be a little bit higher. Hebbian Lake is kind of uh, not so obvious systematically, and then Bora Peak seems to be a little bit asymmetric. And so they can summarize them just to try to uh, analyze it a little bit, and and I think the reason for the complexity in the offset distribution is because of the segmented nature of the ruptures, that you're just not getting a single fault surface that's breaking. You're always getting multiple. So that makes it go up and down a lot. Okay, so I'm going to switch <clears throat> now to geomorphology of the mountain fronts. So this is uh, this book called Tectonic Geomorphology of Mountains, and I noticed it's over there in the the library, and it was written by a this geologist named Bill Bull, and so he's always been studying these uh, mountain fronts, and so here he's trying to show you have a fault here with the sedimentary basin, and it's, I like this sketch, it's very clear, you have the drainage with the alluvial fan, and in cross-section you can see the sedimentary structure with these channels, and uh, adjacent material. So in this case, the rapid tectonic displacement rates are are such that they're driving the mountain up, making this uh, triangular facet here, and giving plenty of room for the sediment to accumulate. Whereas here is a place where if you turn the fault off, it stops. Then over time, we see this mountain front retreat. So the topographic boundary of the mountain front, this Piedmont Junction, is back from the where the fault was, and so this and and these this part of the Piedmont has these remnant pieces of topography that are the bedrock, uh, and it's a shallow sedimentary cover over this piece of the foot wall basically, and we have the old basin here. So what I know is, for example, in Arizona, where I am, this is what the landscape looked like about 8 million years ago, but the fault stopped moving about 8 million years ago. And so in Arizona, it takes about 8 million years for this to occur, something like that. So just trying to say from one case, this is a million-year timescale landscape response. In the desert, in that place, you know, it would be obviously more rapid with higher precipitation and weathering rates, but basically the same ideas would occur. The other thing is that uh, you see this very straight mountain front, so it has low sinuosity. So sinuosity is just the kind of distance along the mountain front, so in this case it's pretty straight, whereas this one is sinuous. You go in and out, in and out. So, uh, this is another way to maybe classify activity as the sinuosity of the mountain fronts. It's a topographic metric that, that these guys did, but they started to compare vertical slip rates versus and versus number of places where they would see different features. So with high vertical slip rates, like one meter per thousand years, so this is a millimeter a year, we have really good fault scarps and, and facets. So which means like the triangular triangle. So what this is saying is this is a million, this is a millimeter per year class of landscape. So that's this kind. And then type two is really is lower rate. So we have 
some scarps, but the the mound in front doesn't show the sharpness. And then type three is almost dead, so type three would be more like this. So they try to, with independent knowledge of the flip rates, look at the landscape to kind of calibrate a little bit these morphometric measures of the activity of the mountain front. And so then, so this is a complicated figure, but this is from Bull. He had these kind of equations. And so let's just look at the, the parameters. So delta U over delta T is the tectonic displacement rate. Delta CD over time is the channel downcutting rate. And then delta PA is aggradation. So that means sedimentation out in the basin in front. And PD means erosion. And so what you can see for the active, active faults, the uplift rate's greater than everything else. And so you just have, you know, the mountain coming up and, and not much entrenchment of the alluvial fence. That means that there's not much erosion down here. And so the PA is the sedimentation here. This is the, the addition of material. Whereas if we were to see this in, in sizing a little bit, that would be the PD, the Piedmont degradation. <coughs> Excuse me. So then here, this one would show some P, PD, but overall the, the delta U over delta T is quite low. So that one is inactive. That's something like right maybe one of these guys. So this pediment, not the Piedmont, is this place here, and so, and then dissected pediment embayment, so this is a kind of a class five landscape. So, Bull, he just tried to give a way of generalizing, so if you're mapping a region, you can uh, try to say, okay, these are, you know, certain classes of landscapes. And this gives us a quick way to classify and focus, just based on the geomorphology, which is easy to assess from topography. And so we can say, all right, well, these are, you know, class five landscapes, so we're not going to worry about them very much for earthquake hazards. But, okay, these guys, class one, two, three, maybe that's where our priority in our study should be. And so here's another view of that where, the class one, the mountain's going up so fast that the channel downcutting and the Piedmont aggradation are equal. Here's the case where it's uplifting, but not quite so fast. And so the channel erosion is actually cutting through both the bedrock and the alluvial fan. And then here's our class 5B case where the channel downcutting and the Piedmont downcutting are equal and we're just lowering because uh, we know this the fact that there's bedrock here in these hills means that the valley used to be above them in the air we've lowered the whole land yeah basic idea of diffusion of topography is that so this is elevation versus distance if you have some initial shape like this right after an earthquake the erosion rate is a function of the curvature of the landscape. So this sharp, this sharp change here means rapid. It's where it will change the most. And so you can calculate the, the change over time just with a, in a simple way, like with a modeling approach. And so there you can, for this simple case with the, you have a, a B is the fan slope. So let's say this fan has a five degree slope and we offset it like this. And A is the half offset. So this is just the way the math works. So A is, is one meter. So this is a two meter offset. And if it's vertical at the beginning immediately, and this is the only process that's changing it, you can compute how it will change with time. But one thing you see is we have this K times T together. And this K times T is called the morphologic age. And 
T is the transport rate, and T is time. And so what it means is that it's really unique only for the product of them. So in other words, if I have a KT, let's say, of 1, this one here, it can be for either a low K and high T or high K, low T. So we multiply them together. So in this case, you know, this says 1 meter squared. And so the KT units are meters squared per thousand years. So this could be 1,000 years times 1 meter squared per thousand years. So T times K. Or you could say, well, it's 10,000 years times 0 0.1 meters squared per thousand years. So the K is the rate constant. And we think the rate constant is a function of the local climate. So I'll explain this more in a moment. But um, uh, so that lets us explore behavior in different places. So I'll uh, show a table shortly on K more. So it can be vertical, but you can say, well, you know, really, the fault scarp isn't vertical. It, it quickly changes to some kind of an initial slope that's like 45 degrees or 35, and then it erodes from there. So you can look at the equations for this, and, and we add a new parameter, this theta, which is the initial slope of the scarp. And so what what people did was to, and this uh, most work, kind of most famous work was done by a USGS scientist named Tom Hanks. And what he did is he, he said, well, if you look at this evolution of these landforms, if you can just measure the slope right in the middle, it's like the slope is rotating, right? So if you measure the, the slope here, just the angle, and then you, you compare that with the height, you can basically look at it, at the behavior over time. So the for higher, basically for older, for this value, KT being larger, which means higher transport rates or more time, the relationship between the peak slope at the middle and the offset will, will, will move, move these curves to the right. So this is an older scarp than, than this one. And the straight line is for the vertical case for this one. And the curving line is for this one, which is how we think things really work. So all that, the reason why you care about this is it's easy to go out in the field and measure the slope right here. Just you put a like a board, like something like this, down on the middle of the scarf and you measure the angle. And then you, you can measure the scarf height. You might want to do a topographic profile, but you can... With this profile, you can project this profile out and this one here, and we get 2A. So it's easy to measure. And then here's what, what, they, what they did, is started to make these measurements for uh, different, well, I'll explain first over here. So here was the observation. So they went in the field and they measured many scarps. And same thing, it's 2A versus the, the central slope. And they realize, well, actually, it's not just the slope in the middle here. You need to correct for this far field slope, the alluvial fan. So if it's on 5 degree alluvial fan slope, that's different than if it's on a 10 degree. So we need to kind of correct this out so it looks like it's occurring on a flat surface. So that's why it says tan theta s minus b. So b is the far field slope. So they made all these measurements and they could see this behavior. And then they they did this on these these Bonneville and Lahontan. and these are shorelines. So they're they're not fault scarps, but they're uh, the edges of a lake that was a like a terrace edge that was eroded. So it has a simple initial shape, kind of like the earthquake scarp, where the so oh, the lake was eroding here at the base, so the lake would have gone like this. But once the lake went down, then the shoreline eroded and was modified. And so they know the age independently from other studies about when these lakes were at that level. 
And so what they could show is, well, if you take like this 16 square meter curve, it goes pretty much right through the data. And so if the, if those, those data represent kind of 14 to 12,000 year old shorelines, it tells us that the, the K is 1.1 square meters per thousand years. So this is a calibration. So now if we go in the same region and we do this measurement, we actually already know K, so we can divide the KT out, divide by K, and we get the time. And so this is called morphologic dating. And uh, it's been used pretty successfully in Western North America, in China, and uh, even in, um, in many places. I'll, I'll show a table in a moment. So here it is. So what, so here was this calibration. So this is basically the K's for shorelines, for, uh, fluvial terrace risers. They did it in Israel, Western China, California, and in Michigan, some lake shorelines. And so, and then also in, in Northern Europe. And what they could show is you see, if you look at, look at Israel, which is the driest, the K's are like 0.1 to 0.5. Then if you go to the deserts of Western North America, you see they're about one. Then you go to China, where it's a, maybe a little bit more wet, it's about three to five. And then you go to Michigan, which is more humid temperate, or to coastal California, you see it's about 10. So it seems like the K goes a little bit with the regional climate, which makes sense because the K is just the measure of how fast material would move down slope. And it's driven not really by runoff. So we assume that these fault scarps aren't crossed by a river. It's just uh, they, other processes that are transporting material, hill slope processes. So you remember my geomorphology lecture, it would be outside of the drainage network and so we we say uh, animal induced disturbances. So if if animals are walking, they kick material down. Uh, if they burrow, if you have animals that are digging and they throw material out, if if you have a steep slope and the animal burrows here, it's going to generally just put more dirt downhill than uphill. It's just easier, right? Whereas if it's flat, it's going to throw the material symmetrically. Also, rain splash. If it's raining. If the raindrop hits here, it's going to send more material down than uphill. So there's a whole class of processes that are dependent on local slope. And then the K is just a general rate constant for how fast material moves. So here's just an example. Remember, I talked about the Bora Peak earthquake. Well, here's the 1983 earthquake. But above that scarp was this, an older scarp. And so these guys did this study and they measured the profiles just of the upper scarp and they did some modeling and they could show they got this nine square meter K, KT value. So then assuming K is 1.1, they said the time of the last earthquake prior to this one was 8,000 years ago. And as a matter of fact, when they did the trenching nearby, it was about 6,000. So it's pretty good. You can say 6,000, 8,000. It's not the same. But the geomorphology is just these simple measurements. It's, you could do it low cost, just go out and measure, and very quickly come up with a good estimate of the approximate time that that prior earthquake occurred. So it's a very impressive. No, but my idea would be it should be higher. It would be 10 or more because of this argument I just made that this is coastal California has, you know, precipitation of like 50 centimeters a year, maybe. So, I mean, here is like two, right? Two meters per year. So it's going to be higher and much more vegetation. Also this, uh, Michigan. So this is in Northern latitudes of the United States and in the East. So it's higher there also. But I presume that humid tra uh, tropical environments would be even higher. But it, it, uh, you would need to do this kind of calibration and then you could use it broadly. 
So the next thing you could say is, well, what if we wanted to just date the fault scarp directly? And so here's some interesting work that was done of cosmogenic dating of this fault scarp. So here's a bedrock scarp. So here's the person there. And this is in Israel where they did this work. And what they could see is actually touched the fault groove. So they know it's the original scarp. And every time there's an earthquake, you know, it, it pops up a little bit, right? So they sampled many cosmogenic dates from the scarp face itself. And so that's what these are. And so they then they model. So if you remember my presentation yesterday on cosmogenic dating, is you can they assume they do a model that looks like this. They have a particle here that should be one of their samples, and they they model the kind of the transport of this particle toward the surface, including a little bit of erosion as it comes to the surface and then it's exposed. And they did this so they had many samples. They they basically dug a, a trough or a trench in the face of the fault. And they did the same kind of calculation for all of the, the uh, samples. And they looked at, there's some erosion off of the top that they could do. And they also looked for the earthquakes. And so they, they said, well, let's just experiment. So here would be a steady creep, like no separate earthquakes, and they got okay results. So this is inside here. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a model calculation. These little dots are the model, and then the circles are the observations of the nuclides. And so then this residual is the basically the observation minus the model. So that's the difference. So when they did a single huge earthquake that offset this thing by about a meter, you see they got a mismatch. It didn't work too well. And so then when they did these series of earthquakes, each one about 20 centimeters. Oh, sorry. This is a centimeter, so 200. So this is two meters, right? This would be 10 meters. So 10 meter earthquake didn't work. And but these two meter earthquakes over the last 12,000 years, gave a pretty good fit. And so you see the residuals are low. So to me, this is really pretty revolutionary because just by doing cosmogenic dating of the bedrock fault scarp, they could get a paleoseismic record. It's really incredible. It, it, I think it's a little bit ambiguous because you could have, you know, do you really know is it, you know, this earthquake, then this one, then this one, or could these two be together? So the resolution isn't really unique for for the detail but it certainly wasn't a single 10 10 meter size earthquake it seems like it's been, and it wasn't steady creep either so it shows us some kind of meter scale two meter scale offset events explains the data best that's probably the safest way to say it and that seems to to work pretty well so i i, I thought that was really pretty cool we do we do a more sophisticated calculation where we can account for the different density for this material, the chalk versus the limestone. So the cosmogenic rays that are coming this way have to penetrate through more mass than this side. So there's a difference in that production. And it's overall depth sensitive. So as it comes to the surface, the production rate increases. And we look at the total production over time in the sample. So, and and finally, there's no erosion in the scarp because it's a uh, hard limestone in the desert. And so it didn't, uh, we don't have to worry about the lowering of the face of the scarp because that would make it more complicated. But here when they, they, they worked on the scarp, they could see the the silicon lines, so they could show that there was almost no change. So it takes a fairly special situation where you can do this, right? Okay, so here's another example where most of these scarves and faults are very simple, right? Just a you know straight line there. 
So one if there's distributed deformation. So this is a, a place I went in Spain and see uh, who was paying for this study. What is this right here? Nuclear plants, right? And so uh, the nuclear guys were, they didn't realize it, but they had a fault right next to a power plant. Yeah. And so they were like, oh, my God. And uh, so they they supported these colleagues, these Spanish colleagues, to do some detailed studies to look at this, this scarp zone. And um, what was interesting is it's a normal fault, but if you look at these uh, fractures here, they look like reverse, right? And so one thing was that this place had a complex uh, form because the fault wasn't breaking all the way to the surface. It was kind of distributed fracturing. And so I didn't work on the Spanish site. We, we went on a field trip there, but with one of my students, uh, he, Hilly, he worked on, well, uh, what if you have a case where you have a, a buried fault at depth, but you have some fractures at the surface? And the fractures, if their orientation, how does it change? And so then we calculated, this is a mechanical model, so we use like a Coulomb approach, but these are frictionless cracks. And so if they have stress on them, they can move. And so in these profiles, the, the solid line would be if there was no cracks. And then as, and then the other lines just show different calculations of activating these cracks and the topographic profile. So here you can see, you know, the vertical ones and these ones that are dipping opposite the fault, they have a hard time moving, but they will move. And here, so these are the blind ones. So there's a little bit below the surface. And then these would be cracks or secondary fractures around the main fault. And so here when the fault makes it to the surface, you can have really significant activity and almost reverse this crack here actually flips back the opposite direction. So it makes a, a little graben that has a secondary reverse fault on the side of it. And then here these vertical guys don't get activated too much nor do the ones that dip opposite the fault, but they do get activated some. And so our point was that we have to be careful that we may interpret uh, a really, you know, maybe erosion or complexity in the the scarp to, to erosional processes, but it could be due to secondary fracturing. That's a simple answer. And so this, this uh, Spanish scarp was... Um, a good example of that, that actually underneath here, the fault's dipping to the right. It's a normal fault, but all you really see at the surface is these reverse structures. And so that was one of the key things to discuss with the nuclear guys as well. What kind of fault is it, a reverse or a normal fault? So after some work, they showed, okay, it's a normal fault. And then, uh, but it had this complex scarp shape. And the other thing was that originally this, limestone they thought it was a limestone so they thought it was jurassic so they thought it was a very old fault but then when they looked more carefully almost all the limestone is soil carbonate so it's actually a very young accumulation of carbonate in the soil so it's quaternary not jurassic so that's why the nuclear guys got suddenly really nervous because the geology changed completely from 150 million years to 1 million and it's 10 meter high scarp so, uh, so far, no problem. But it, uh, whenever there's a nuclear plant nearby, usually there's lots of money for seismic hazards. Uh, these fault, this, uh, I was, the, so no earthquakes, but just looking at the length, they estimated 6.5 to 7. So probably the power plant's okay because usually you can do seismic safety for 6.5 or 7. It's not in the near field, maybe it's okay. Once you get to a 7.5, then you almost have to move the power plant. So uh, just moving on to show some kind of related to this point, and it shows this sketch from this uh, famous American geologist named G.K. Gilbert, and he was thinking about this problem in the 1890s. And what he realized was, well, you know, when there's an earthquake, 
it doesn't always have to be so simple, just a single trace. You can have this kind of very complex interaction between this shallow hanging wall material and the fault itself. And so you might have actually the nearest hanging wall is stuck. And here's where the scarf ends up being, not at the bedrock fault scarf, but out in the sedimentary units. The reason here is because the rocks fail most easily in tension. And so when you extend, you the easiest thing to do is just pull it apart. That's easier than making it slide. And then here's a little back rotation. Here's rotation with a grobin. So we see this a lot. And here's just step down, step down. So just some schematic of the kinds of uh, complexity we might see. Would you have a question? So, so this just talking about complexity. Now we'll go into some of the paleoseismic uh, interpretations. So one thing that happened was this guy Wallace, so another famous uh, American geologist who studied normal faults, among other things, was he wrote this paper in 1977 where he looked at some fault scarps, like actually this is 1983, but he had seen some of the other ones. And he said, well, okay, here's the main scarp, but you see soon afterwards this debris starts to accumulate in this kind of a wedge, right? So this flat surface underneath here. And then this material is falling off the scarp, and so it's sedimenting down, and it's thicker against the scarp and thinner going away. And so he showed, you know, he made this kind of a famous sketch here, and then this whole idea came together. They called the colluvial wedge model. And then so it became kind of an interpretive uh, approach for looking at normal faulting paleoseismology. And what it, the basic model would be something like this. So you have the earthquake, and then over time, the fault scarp erodes, and so we get this buried free face and this wedge of material that's colluvial. So that's why we call it colluvial wedge. You have a second earthquake after some time, and soil forms on the top of that first wedge. And so the sort of second earthquake occurs, more material is deposited, the second wedge. And so the the then the interpretation of the paleo earthquakes comes from these stacked colluvial wedges. So that's a very simple but commonly used approach for normal faults. So here you can see C1, C2. So McAlpin, the author of our this textbook, he's a, he loves colluvial wedges. So he wrote many papers about it, studying it. And so he even had these codes for different parts of the topography and uh, the soils as they came into the the colluvial wedges. So all these D, F, S, M, G, S, X, these are all these codes for the kind of sedimentary units associated with the fault scarp. So he wrote these papers about it. And what you can see is, is this cartoon showing the kind of complex rupture characteristics right after the earthquake and then the modification immediately after the earthquake we start to see this colluviation and the the free face of the, the fault scarp just fails it just collapses and so we get a more stable form and then we start to do the diffusion type modification just covering it in a kind of more simple fine-grained sense and so now if there's another earthquake, we'd see this repeat again. So here's another model, same kind of thing. You know, A to B. C is the second earthquake, so we bury that. E and F. So there's three earthquakes in this model. Uh, and so it starts to be, you can imagine, a little bit complicated to uh, interpret. And... But one thing also is to see this style of kind of a cartoon or retro deformation for how to slide things back to explain what they saw. So here's an example of a colluvial wedge. And I'll just go forward. There's the wedge. And so you, the fault's right here by the shore. And so you see that wedge-shaped deposit that's coming right after the earthquake. You see it has a flat bottom. And then... This is the wedge itself, and these 
other UD and W are sediments that were deposited on top as the scarp became less steep and uh, degradation continued. So it's just a single wedge. Uh, so whereas, remember, this picture, there could be two and so on. And so I think the record, remember when I sh gave the lecture on trench excavation and I showed these deep trenches, like this nine meter deep bench trench. So McAlpin, he dug and I think he had 12 wedges in one trench, but he had to go nine meters deep because each time it's like, you know, about a meter height. 12 wedges, so 12 earthquakes in nine meters. So it's kind of small because it's, it's not quite a meter each time. And I remember I reviewed the proposal. I was on some committee and he said, if we want to get these long records, we have to go deep. And so he asked for extra money. And so we said, well, you know, I guess you're right. But it costs a lot because it's a big, it's like a construction project, you know. So that's it for wedges. Uh, I just, it's important. It's a, you hear it all the time when you're talking about normal fault pillar seismology. And so it's almost abused too much because then people are just looking for wedges, even if they're not really there. So you have to be careful. Is it really, do you see it or is there something else going on? So for example, this is, that has a, maybe a, a little bit of a wedge, but the main thing, this is, this is a different log, but you see the, the main fault scarp or the main fault here. And what happened is that during the faulting, it caused some rotation of this material and, and this tilting then uh, it's kind of a drag of material next to the fault. And so you see this deformation here. So all this material is deformed. And then here it's covered by the post-earthquake debris. So it's not, it's, you know, it's kind of a semantic point. Is this a wedge or not? It's just the debris that's coming out over the old material. And these X's here, what's important to see is those X's show the eroded fault. So that's the free face that was cut back. And whereas this line below here is it's still the actual fault surface. Whereas above it, the material fell down and so it retreated backward. Uh, you, it can, there's some rules, like if the height, uh, there's, I don't remember the details, but something like the, the, the wedge height is about half the offset, something like that. So you can see, um, here, you know, here, let's say this height is two meters. We don't know exactly. And here's the wedge. It's about a meter tall. So then if you just look at the wedges, you could say, well, it looks like it's about half of the offset each time. So you can use the wedges to help reconstruct the size of the scarp, which then indicates the size of the earth. That's the colluvial wedge forming three years after the earthquake. So it continues to form for some time, but it is a, it, it's a, it's landform as a kind of a debris slope. But really we think of it more as a stratigraphic indicator of, or a facies indicator of the earthquake. Is it possible to see liquefaction on the colluvial wedge? You, it can, um, usually the colluvial wedges are pretty coarse grained and so they're not as susceptible to liquefaction as a more fine grained and uh, hydrated material, but, uh, and also the, you know, the wedge is forming right after the earthquake, so in some ways the liquefaction is driven by the earthquake itself, there's no wedge in the earthquake, unless it's the prior wedge, but the prior wedge, the old wedge, like in this picture, you know, once this wedge is formed, here the next earthquake occurs, you could liquefy the the older wedge, but usually it's pretty consolidated by this time, so it may not be susceptible to liquefaction. Here's another one. This is a kind of an ugly log, if, excuse my uh, criticism. You see it's a really a, a subjective log. There's almost nothing to see in this log in terms of the, the geology. You see uh, what looks like these S's are these soils, and so they're arguing that the Soil indicates time of stability, and so this 
is the modern soil, S1, and then S2 would be a prior soil, and C1 is the colluvial wedge. So there's a coding. So colluvial wedge 1 has the soil 1 growing over it. There's colluvial wedge 2 with the soil 2 growing over it. Colluvial wedge 3 with the soil 3 growing over it. So there's one, two, three earthquakes in this log. But uh, my criticism of it is just that it's such a interpretive log, you can't see really what's going on. But maybe to give them some credit, maybe they had a more objective log, like in the prior image or something. And so this is just uh, then to show their geochronology. So they used uh, C14, which is the X's, and also thermal luminescence. So this is an older one. They didn't do OSL. Now you guys know that. And they did bulk samples of the soils. So that's what these are boxes where they took uh, bulk. I think these are bulk uh, bulk C14. Yeah, in the soil it would be bulk C14. So dating the distributed organic material and then comparing with the individual radiocarbon dates. So this M means modern, and then 70, 370. So that's similar at the 150 bulk date. But then you see the TL dates are kind of older. They're one, 1,100 years, 3,200 years, 3,400 years. So they're really looking like they're a little bit too old. Uh, and, and so perhaps this is uh, showing that incomplete bleaching that it's not really working that well. And so then coming down, we see these these old ages here. You see this 8400 right there for the carbon-14 date. It's really too old. You see it's surrounded by 1300, 2600, 2600. So that's a, a basically a sample, kind of a bad sample. It probably was a old piece of vegetation that lived in the landscape for a long time and then was incorporated in this deposit. So shows why you would want to have many samples. So here's another example. So I'm just going through these different earthquake uh, stories. This is in northern Europe. And here, there wasn't so much of ground breakage as warping. So this is more of a monocline, kind of like the example from Spain. And the the dashed lines show the paleo, um, kind of the shape of the, the bedding. So the C unit, the DC level, uh, was here and, and, but there was some erosion. You can see B comes in and erodes the top off of that layering. But the, the earthquake that they think occurred is sometime between, sometime around C. It's either the bottom of C or the top of C. And you can kind of tell that because this angles are unconformity. Clearly B is more uniformly across multiple layers, right? So for sure B is younger than the last earthquake. And that would be 678 to 894. But then these samples like this one, 613, 532, these are older than the last earthquake. So and then these guys are even older. So again, we could use OxCal to figure out the age, and, but now in your brain you can see, okay, so 613 to 770 going up to 678 to 894. So it's some time in that 700 AD time period that this earthquake occurred. So uh, this is, you know, not quite the sharp rupture like these, these kinds of earthquakes, it's more of this, you know, warping of the material with some fracturing uh, in the interior. But, for example, if you look at this layer, its offset is maybe, you know, 50 centimeters. But if you look at the total change uh, from here to here, it might be closer to a meter. So the faulting is only part of the total deformation. There's some distributed warping that's occurring in this place. And it can be perhaps because there's a lot of vegetation. So the, the vegetation is kind of holding the layers together. So it's kind of, and it can't break. It just. Okay. So I, we've already seen this, but as we come to the end of this lecture, the, 
idea of um, retro deformation. So when you have a log, a complex log like this one, you just can slowly peel away different geologic steps. And so you see H. Well, okay, so it looks like the first thing we need to do is get rid of the erosion because this was a, a, some erosion. So then there's G. Okay, so then let's get rid of this earthquake right here. So we'll strip away this wedge. And then we'll go to E and we'll, we'll heal this earthquake. So there's that wedge there. And then D, we get rid of the wedge. And we were just after this last, that earthquake. Then C, we get rid of that earthquake. We have this big wedge here. And then B, we get rid of the wedge. And then A, we go back to zero. So this is a really useful approach when you get to the end of your trench logging to make a cartoon like this that explains what happened. And it's extremely valuable to explain to other people because sometimes it's so complicated. When you look at this, you know, somebody says, well, I don't even know what's going on there, you know? So then you say, well, let me explain. Let's, you know, let's go back. And so this is a, basically a model for the history of that site. And then as you make it, then you say, okay, well, do I have it? Can I explain everything?